If I have to take a casual look at the entrepreneurship ecosystem in Ghana, I will be looking at the system that existed, where you have people trading, of course, and then of course then there is those who get skills and also trade their skills, be it carpentry, be it um, those who make garments, hairdressers, etc. Then there is a new trend also of people who have the desire to end poverty, especially generational poverty, and then also people who have an appreciation that, especially those who've gone through school, who have an appreciation that formal jobs are limited. And so if they have to thrive economically, then they, they would have to find a way to do that. And so they venture into either also trading or also going into social entrepreneurship, as we call it. So offering some social services. And then those same people looking at putting together skills to get some things manufactured so they can sell. So I will be looking at all these players. And then I would say that the desire to do good so that you earn money is pushing a lot of younger people into this space that we call entrepreneurship. It's become prominent, especially for the schooled generation, the generation that went to school, because, like I mentioned earlier, there's no formal job. So these are one part of the people that play a role in it. And then there is also the government that does something in the space because it also has a responsibility to make sure that unemployment ends or as much as possible is reduced. It has a responsibility of making it the space conducive for the people who play in it. So there's also the issue of governance. There's also the issue of rules and regulations and laws in, in the space. And then there are big players that are supporting, that private players that are support, expected to support the people who venture into entrepreneurship. So you are looking at persons who are giving investments, um, who are giving out some money for the people who are playing the role of um, selling or trading either services or commodities. So all the various players in this ecosystem can appreciate that there's a gap, especially when it comes to funding. There is an issue of people having funds, but for specific things, and people needing funds, but for also you know, needing funds for other things that the, the, the funds available are not offering. One gap that I also notice is that, especially for younger entrepreneurs, there is a buffer for failure um, you know, that is needed. We all appreciate and hear stories of great entrepreneurs and we understand that they fail a couple of times, a number of times before they thrive. How did they thrive? What did they fall on when they failed? Most young people who are entrepreneurs are having to be entrepreneurs so that they can eat. And that is basic. So if this is what we provide feeding, for example, and I want to use it as basic as it is for me, if I fail in that space, how do I survive to even continue to thrive in the business that I am building? That is why we don't see sustainable businesses. So that's also one gap I, f I find. Social security and insurance does not exist in, in the entrepreneurship space, especially for those who work for themselves. The world of work in itself is changing, even for formal work, such that people are working on part-time, people are working on projects, and when you're done, you take your money, you go, kind of work is also thriving. We've had generations of people who run small businesses, small shops, and those shops never grew to be big. And this is because they don't have a buffer. So after paying fees for their children, they don't have money to reinvest into these businesses to grow the business so that they can employ more people to reduce the number of unemployment that we have. So we cannot expect businesses to thrive, grow, private businesses to thrive, grow, especially from our space where we know how the businesses start. They start as one person. We cannot expect a, a one-person business to grow if there's no support 
for this person when the, the person fails, if there's no support for insurance. So all these people have grown, their businesses do not exist, yet they are more a liability as well because they don't have insurance as well. In the um, technical and vocational education space, I think there's also the gap of transition. Traditionally, an apprenticeship is for, for example, three years, and then there is this, you know, serving your master kind of thing that makes you stay for an extra year. And so you become what they call the senior apprentice. Now the senior apprentice position takes you off the chores in the workshop but gives you the opportunity to learn more, especially the essential skills, how your master or ma uh, madam is dealing with customers and things like that. So that helps you to transition. Now this transition for most people is not paid for. They, they, you know, it's a service they offer their masters, but they don't get paid for it. So this senior apprentice might have learned and perfected the skill of stitching and has an extra one year of possibly relearning essential skills, as I mentioned. But the skill of stitching is not paid for when this person is offering. So it makes it very difficult for them to even stay to perfect their skills. And then the problem with the transition also comes in because then they don't get the opportunity to stay, to study, understudy their um, their masters or madams as we call them. The issue of transition, especially in Ghana, is complicated. It's complicated in the sense that, one, we are not industrialized. We are not a huge a space. We, we don't have huge spaces of industrialization. For, for example, in Germany, in actual fact, the TVET system is run by the industry, for example, right? And this is because industry is big, is available, and is employing these skills. For us, we don't have that. So people train and they want to work for themselves so they can make the money that they need to thrive. Yet there's also the new kind of employment that's coming where people are putting skills together to produce. As small as this space is, it is a space that we need to look into because people in this sector are also complaining about the kind of skills that they get. Two things they complain about, the quality of the skill and then the attitude of the people who have these skills. So people will finish apprenticeship, will finish technical and vocational education. Um, somebody who is making shoes will employ them, yet they cannot stay for two months because they have poor work ethics or because they are not given the best in terms of quality of their skills. How do we fill this gap is something that's been talking, you know, like for ages in this ecosystem, we've had the conversation of industry and training, you know, conversations that needs to, to be had so that we can look at the skills mismatch. But it looks like we're still having this conversation even today. But it's an important conversation that we need to continue to have. And this is because Skills training in itself is even changing. Apprenticeship is becoming something that is getting into formal systems. Governments are taking huge interest in technical and vocational education. There are policies that are supporting technical and vocational education. So it's also being, it's also a space that is being governed. It actually fact, it's been governed all these years. Normally people will say that this is the informal sector to, to to say that this sector is scattered, but it's not as scattered as we think because the sector has trade associations and these governance systems in the apprenticeship area cannot be taken for granted and so we can always work with the governance system at the zonal levels, at the national levels, at trade associations in, in this area. So it's important that those people are brought into the conversation. When we are having conversation of skills mismatch, Normally we are looking at academia and then we are having conversations with industry and we are having conversations with persons who have um, possibly medium scale manufacturing hubs and all that. But the people who are really employing are the people who are employing five people, three people, 15 people on the ground. And so we cannot be having 
skills mismatch conversations with the university professors and the people who have um, big, in our term, big corporations alone, it's not as though they are not good players, but essentially the players in this sector are also the people who are employing few people. And if they are not in the conversation, then it's, it's, it's not going to be, we are not solving that problem. If we are not having skills mismatch conversation with the Garment Makers Association, if we are not having it with the Plumbers Association, if we are not having it with the various trade associations, we are not going to solve this problem. Also, in the complication of transition, especially in the TV sector, is the issue of persons who get the skills, getting technical skills, but not enough business sense, if I should call it. There is also the complication with them not knowing that there is the need to innovate. The fact that you are great with plumbing skills does not mean you can be fantastic in the management of your own skills to make money with it. And so there's, there's a gap in training which is being you know, managed in the various schools especially where students who are taking the various technical courses are getting some level of training in terms of business and management training. The challenge with this is that it becomes another academic process where they, some of them are having to write exams instead of practical appreciation of business skills so that they can run their own businesses or they can offer service and offer it in a way that they are paid for it. They can quantify their hours and things like that. So that's the gap there. It's important that we look at training and transition from training to the world of work and how that can be done. In this space, innovation is very important and innovation should be taught in schools. We should appreciate that the kind of things that are products that people are demanding for require various skill sets to produce. And so it's, it should be taught in school that people would know that we have to work with other people to get the kind of product that is relevant to the market so that persons who are making um, doors can in learn how to make doors in schools if it is carpentry can appreciate that to make a door they might have to contact or be trained to work with the persons who are learning electrical so that they can put a bell system in the in the door this kind of innovations should be taught in school so that it can support transition and then it can also support working in teams to produce the relevant products that can be sold in the market to also be competitive.